In this video, I want to help you get from either a level one or two in terms of drum production and get you to that third level, that level where your drums and your music overall stands out from the pack. I believe after watching this video, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take your drum game to the next level and hopefully you're going to fall into that level three category. Let's just get right into the doll because I have so much shit I want to show you that I think is going to be a huge help. Doesn't matter what kind of music you make. Now, before we dive in, let me give you a quick preview of all three. Now that's level one, obviously it sounds like shit. We've all been there though at some point and there's gonna be some really good lessons to learn in this for everyone I think, so we're gonna come back to that. Next up is a quick preview of level two. Getting there. Little more interesting, little more variation, starting to sound better. And then finally we're gonna get to level three which sounds like this. Now, obviously this one's the winner, but I'm gonna be honest, there's nothing crazy going on in here. I wanna just jump back to levels one and two though, because we can learn lessons from those two that were basically just applied in this drum loop that we created. None of this is hard. I really just think I have to show you what it is. Okay, we are back at level one and I wanna go through 10 different things we can improve in this loop to get us to that next level of our drum programming and processing. So first up, you may wanna stuff some cotton balls in your ears. I'm gonna play it one more time so you could hear this mess. That drum fill at the end is is amazing. What's funny is though, I like I remember making drums that sounded like this. It feels like it was yesterday. Like I remember when my shit sounded like this. Let's go through the first problem with this. And it's the fact that this is only a four bar loop. If I needed to use these drums to get through the whole track, it's gonna be very repetitive and very boring when it's the same four bar loop. The listener always wants change. So we're gonna expand on this drum loop with each level we move to, but a four bar repeating loop is too short. It needs to be longer. All right, now the second mistake here, and this is something I see with the hundreds of students and their projects I've gone through in Cosmic Academy because I sit down one-on-one -on -one with them. This is probably the most common one, is the fact that they layer too many full drum loops on top of each other. So for example, I have this first kick. Then the loop underneath also includes a kick. And finally this loop. That's three drum loop, top loops, whatever you wanna call them, but they all have that kick drum. Unnecessary, you only need one kick. Now, we could talk about layering kicks with the bottom and top, that's a different topic for a different day. In this case, be careful with the loops you choose. You don't wanna keep stacking loops that have that kick drum transient that's gonna overlap and create a world of problems from phasing to peak issues, it's a disaster. Now, the third problem we're gonna see here is too much EQ on these samples. So for example, as I rifle through at the bottom, you're gonna notice how much much EQ is on a lot of these sounds, it's over the top, all this boosting to get the sound I want or need. Listen, if you're using samples and you need to do with that much work to make it right, shouldn't that be a red flag that you chose the wrong sound? The beauty of splice and sample packs is that you can just pick a quality sample that does the job, the job you need. There's nothing wrong with boosting, but when you need to do that much and over so many sounds, that's when you have to catch yourself and realize, I'm probably polishing a turd at this point. Find the better sample, that's always the answer. Now number four is gonna come down to compression, and this is just putting compressors on sounds because you saw someone else do it in a tutorial. So here my kick. Nice, that glue compressor. Then we jump down here. Nice, that glue compressor. Just because you saw someone else do it doesn't mean it will work for you. You have a different sound, a different mix. That is the wrong way to use a compressor. And that also leads me to the fifth tip, which is people just drop these compressors on and don't change the settings. They just think that the default setting is some magic setting that's gonna work for their track. Never. You always need to be adjusting your threshold, ratio, attack, and release to either shape your sound or have an intention to control it, but either way, they have to be adjusted. That setting is not a universal setting. All right, the sixth thing we can improve on in this loop is the random panning. You're gonna notice there's just multiple loops favoring one side of the mix. So for example, we have this top loop. I also have these perk layers.
Look, panning is important, but at the same time, we always want to think about balance. If you're putting something to the left, always think what is going to balance it on the right side. If you start to put too many things on one side, left or right, the mix starts to like lean to one side and it just doesn't sound correct. Your mix is out of balance. So anytime you're going to pan, we do want to think about balance. If something goes left, what's going to go right? And ideally you want that element to balance it in terms of importance and volume. You can't have like three lead sounds on the left and some quiet little effects on the right that we barely hear because that volume is still going to favor one ear versus the other. So you want to sort of match their level and importance in the mix when you're going to pan things left and right. The seventh one is going to be duplicating channels to make it bigger and fatter. I think we've all done this when we started out at some point. You think, hey, I want this to be bigger. Let's duplicate it. It's going to be even bigger and fatter. Technically, it's just making it louder. So for example, I have this percussive kind of tonal layer. and I've duplicated it. It's the exact same channel just playing twice. Now, sure, it sounds fatter, it sounds bigger in the mix, but that would have been no different as me just muting one of them and raising the volume of it. Let's stick with this drum layer for number eight, and this is gonna be using tonal drum samples that are just not in key with your track. Now for this one, I don't have a bass line like the other two ideas will have, but I wanna show you how to find the key of a tonal drum sample, and then how we can pitch it to sort of fit musically with everything else that's going on. The first way you can find the key of this sample would be to just drop the basic tuner plugin on here, now, whatever DAW you're in, there's an there's a instance of this plugin in your DAW. And it's basically just gonna tell you the note of whatever channel it's on. So if I press play here, we can clearly see it's playing a C note. Now, the next way we could do this is using a spectrum analyzer. So I'm gonna do the EQ8, I'm gonna double click it. It's gonna give me a nice big visual representation here of the frequency spectrum. Now, as I move my cursor around, we will notice in the bottom left, it's gonna show me the note and frequency that I'm hovering over. So let's just find the fundamental frequency of this uh, tonal percussive layer. That is where that bottom loud peak is. And sure enough, in the bottom left, it tells us it's a C note. So I could definitely say that this is playing a C, but what happens if I wanted to put this in the root note of my song and I'm in E or D sharp, something like that. Let's do D sharp. How would I get there? Well, I can come into my audio sample here and I would just move from C to D sharp, which is going to be three half steps. So I'll go one, two, three. And now, I can pitch that tonal sample to the key of my track. This is really important though, to getting that musicality from the drums to match the instruments that you have. Now, you don't always have to only live in the root. You could also choose the third, fourth, or fifth, typically work well. The other approach to this, if you're able to do it, is honestly just using your ear. I know not everyone has an ear where they can hear our things in key or not. That's completely fine. That's where these tools will be more helpful. But at the end of the day, if you do trust your ear and you could understand, hey, this sounds right, this sounds like it's fitting, you could always just pitch these samples, do it by ear, and sort of find a sweet spot that just musically works. On to the next one, number nine is going to be making sure the timing of our drums is appropriate and they, they fit together. So for example, I have this hi-hat loop here. Cool hi-hat loop if we're in solo mode. But the issue here is this is playing triplets, but nothing else in my track is playing triplets. You have to be careful with this. It's one thing to have cool syncopation between your drums, but a lot of times if you just use a loop and you're like, oh, this loop sounds cool on its own and you're unaware that it's playing triplets, but you know the rest of your track is playing standard eighths or sixteenths, you're gonna get this overlap where rhythmically things are just not gonna fit, things are not going to align. So be careful with that. A lot of times triplets kind of find their way into a level one production, a level one drum production. Just be careful with that. Finally, the 10th one is going to be a lack of continuity within the drum kit itself. Because most of what we do nowadays is sample based, we're pulling samples from Splice randomly, right? And it's awesome. They sound incredible. There's so many options out there to us, but we can be pulling 
you know, a one sample from a dubstep pack, another one from a techno pack, another one from a big room house, another from deep house, another from tropical house. And before you know it, you combine all these samples and it kind of sounds like this. It's like, what is this? What genre is this? What kind of music is this? What kind of feeling am I trying to impart? It's showing signs of a lot of different things. You want continuity in your drum kit. Your drum sound should match each other, whether you're going for like a drum machine sound living in, you know, 808s, 909s, or you're going for more organic recorded kind of drums. You really just want to make sure you choose sounds that are somewhat close in nature. Typically, they do kind of live within the same genre, same rough nature of sound. And I think that's the 10th and one of the more important ones to keep in mind. Now let's go on to level two. And I feel like if you're struggling still with your drums, this is probably where you find yourself. It sounds decent, but you're missing something and you just can't quite figure out what it is to put it together. Don't worry, I got you. But let me show you the example. Let me show you what this sounds like. There's signs of it being good, but it still sounds like shit. Okay, sounds decent, but with these level two drums, I wanna go through five things that we improved on from level one, which I think is important to stress because you need to have these as like foundational pillars to building your drums, good decision-making. But then I also wanna go through five things we could still improve on this one, which will help us get to level three. So don't skip ahead. It's really important that we go through this and you understand what these decisions are. All right, for the first positive, we have a longer drum loop here and there's a ton of variation. It's actually kind of fun and interesting. So right away, I see it's eight bars long. We also have these cool things like these little uh, fills. And it keeps things moving along. Every couple bars, there's that extra variation for the listener. That's really important. I'm also doing some cool little kick fills here. And if we kind of play it all together, you notice, I'll, I'll play the first four bars here, how just when things start to become repetitive, boom, that extra fill comes in or that kick variation comes in. That's so important to keeping the listener kind of moving along and the track moving along. So if you want to break it down, it's like we have a, one variation in this first bar, a second variation in the second bar, then again, back to that other fill. And then in the fourth bar, we have the kick variation. This is nice. This is a really good thing. This is a positive. You want to be thinking like this with your drums. Now, the second really good thing that's going on here in this loop is there's good sound selection in the sense that a lot of these sounds are unique and, and providing specific value to the drum kit. It's not just stacking tenths of the same top loops on top of each other, where they're not really bringing anything new to the table. It's just doing the same thing over and over. So if I just quickly go through them all, obviously we have kick, clap, the open hat. Now a top loop, which is gonna give a little bit more movement. plays really well because even the symbols between the two loops sound different. That's a positive. Then we move on to a shaker. We have this uh, percussive metallic sound. I'm horrible at labeling. It's a cool layer though, adding a lot of groove, a lot of character. Now that we've heard them all, you can see that they each sort of have their own sound. That's the positive here. Now for the third, it's really just gonna build off of one of the previous things we talked about in level one. There's continuity with these sounds. Not only did we just talk about how they each provide their own value, but they sound like they're part of the same drum kit from the same world, the same nature. That's huge. For the fourth good thing in this, I wanna highlight the fact that there's just more rhythm and groove than the previous example. In level one, everything was like very quarter note driven. It's like bum, 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 bum. Where this one, there's a lot more of those like, 16th notes, the in-betweens, the dotted eighths, and, and there's more rhythm and groups. So like for example, this layer here provides a ton of it. Same with the fills, they're providing a lot of rhythm and groove. Now obviously some of this can be genre dependent. Uh, this is more of a house style drum kit with the bass line and all that stuff going on. 
But even if you were working in bass music, like you still need to take advantage of dotted eighth, sixteenths, and create a little more rhythm and groove with your patterns, or whether you're doing the hat rolls and trills and things like that. Uh, so something to keep in mind, but absolutely a necessity as we climb that ladder of of drum programming. Now, for the fifth positive, I want to bring up it's spatial awareness. We're going to expand on this even further with level three, but you start to realize I need some shit going on on the left and right. Like I need some movement in the stereo field. And there are things like ping pong delays in this case that are doing the job. You also start to take advantage of reverbs to create some space in the mix. These are good things, but they also lead to a lot of problems, which now we're gonna dive into. Okay, before we move on to level three, let's go through some of the things we can improve in this loop, which are going to be instrumental to being able to achieve quality in those level three drums. If you've been finding this helpful so far, do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already. I have to do that. <laughs> but let's start with the kick drum. This is the first thing we can improve in this example. And kick drums are hard because most times we're selecting them by ear, right? You're going through your sample pack, you're, you're going through the samples and you listen to them. Click, clack, boom, pop. You're making your decision based on your ear which isn't always going to work because think about, you know, what are you listening on? Who knows? I don't know. You could be in a shitty bedroom or shitty speakers. You could be on a fucking laptop for all we know. And a kick can sound good, but you also have to make sure it feels good. It's providing enough punch on the bottom end. First off, I'm just going to play my song and you'll hear the kick clicks through. It punches. We can hear it. It's very audible. short, it's snappy, there's pop to it, but it's missing so much low end. So let me give you an example of this. What we have here is span on the left, metric AB on the right. The left side is going to show us the frequency response of whatever's playing in metric AB. So whenever I'm on the blue tab, you're going to hear my drum loop. If I go to the orange tab, you're going to hear a reference track. So watch what happens when I flip between the two. Both are peaking at zero, but they're going to sound wildly different. The sound might be obvious. Let's also use our eyes though. What I want you to do is look at the low end. So this is my kick drum and it's it's bopping around down here, but it's not getting much higher than, what is that, like minus 34-ish. If you look in the top right corner over here, it's not really going higher than about this. Now I'm gonna look at the reference track and I wanna see how loud roughly his kick is going. So this is the kick, this consistent blob that's going up and down. It's a couple decibels louder than mine. It's also lower than mine in frequency as well. These two things are going to combine to the kick sounding fatter, punchier, bigger. So something you could do here is have span open while you're selecting your kicks and make sure it sounds good, but it also looks good. This is helpful if you don't have a subwoofer or a wearable subwoofer like sub pack, something like that. If your eyes and ears align, that's usually a good thing, but you can't always trust your ears dependent on your current listening situation. Now, the second thing I wanna talk about that we can improve, which happens a lot of the time, is our drums or our mix isn't bright. So what do we do? We start boosting the highs on everything. So for example, uh, what do we have? We have the claps boosted. Sure, they sound nice and bright. We have the hat boosted. Great, we have the top loop boosted in the high end. And you could see as I go down, boom, another one. That had it, so you get the point, right? This is very common, why? You want your track to be brighter. Make things brighter, boost the highs. It doesn't work that way. If you just keep boosting the highs of everything, what you're going to get is just this wash of noise, but there's no clarity. Think of it like 15 people talking over each other. Right, it's just volume at that point. And when you do it in the high end, there's no tonality. So the ear can't separate the different instruments because noise doesn't have tonality to it. So you might have one sound tss, 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 and another one going tss, 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 tss. You put them on top of each other, it just becomes tss, and it's just this like blanket of noise. So instead, 
how can we get that brightness without having to boost everything? Start with drum sounds that are naturally bright. By nature, they're bright. So for example, there are multiple types of hi-hats. You could have very tonal, tong, 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 kind of like, you know, if you were to hit closer to the center of the cymbal, it's more tonal than it is noisy. Versus you could have one that is tss, tss, tss. That is what you would want to use if you needed more noise. You're going to get bright mixes by choosing bright sounds. You're not going to get bright mixes by polishing a turd and making something that was dark, trying to make it bright. It has to have it there already. On to the next one, number three. To me, this is probably the most important thing I'll talk about in this entire video. We're really going to look at this in level three drums, but it is the shape envelope and dynamics of your sounds. If your shapes are not correct, like their length, their envelope, and they don't match well, your track's just gonna sound sloppy. So I wanna give you a couple of examples of this. Let's start with this clap here. Okay, now if I solo it, it's a great clap, but there's also a lot of length on this clap. And why I'm not crazy about all of this length right here, there's gonna be other sounds that are gonna to wanna to fill in that space, right? If we even just look at the programming of this, sure, if this clap hits, it's gonna play until this next clap, but look at all the other hits that are going on. Do I need all that length and tail from this clap? Well, if my goal is to have punchy drums, that's not as punchy as something that is short and a little more abrupt. So let me give you an example of this. I'm gonna turn off the uh, reverb for a second. That's gonna be next. And if I just play with the shape of this, watch the difference here of... So you see, by shortening it, it makes it punchy and tight. But what happens if you want that tail? You like that tail. Here's the difference. The first way, I was just using that sample the way it was given to me, with the tail on it. Uh-uh. I want to first get control of that sample, and if I want to add tail back to it, I want to be able to control that tail. I have zero control over this tail right now because it was written onto the audio file. I would rather shorten it, make it tight, punchy, and let me understand what dynamic availability do I even have in my mix, right? If I shorten this first, now you might be like, ooh, that sounds a little too dry. Good, now I can go fill that space with something like a reverb. But if I leave this tail on, it might not fit dynamically with all the other things going on in my drum loop. So many samples are way longer than we need them to be. So if I can first shorten the sample, get it to fit with my track, I'm gonna be much better off. So I'm gonna do this again in real time for you and I'm just using my ear to find the sweet spot of where it seems to fit these other drum layers. And here, it gives me available space to play with, which, as I said, we're gonna talk about. We're gonna fill that space with reverbs and things like that. Let me give you a couple other examples, though, of shape. Next, let's take a look at this shaker. I'm gonna play it in context. Something about this shape-wise, again, I'm using it as it is, but that shape doesn't fit my mix. It sounds like the shaker's dragging. Now, if I look at this, there's a very slow attack on this. The volume slowly comes up. So every time it's triggered, tss, 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 there's that little bit of delay as the volume tries to come up. That's not gelling with my song right now. So what I wanna be able to do is adjust this shape so once again, it fits my mix, the sounds that I currently have. So you can see as I move this around, there were some spots that sounded better or worse. I'm gonna do it again and try and really find the sweet spot, but what happens if I still want 
the soft attack. Because you notice as I move this up, it does become more of like a hi-hat, tick, 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 or a shaker with a transient sort of thing. What happens if I still want the slow attack? Well, then I can go to my attack over here, but it's going to give me the ability to control the attack once again, where if I use the sample, I have to play with the attack that they gave me. And in this case, it was too long. As I'm doing this, you're noticing some parts seem to fit better, some parts don't. This is the name of the game. It's like, I look at these sounds as colors that I can paint with, but it's up to me to get the right shade of these colors. So sure, this could be blue, but what happens if I want a little bit lighter shade of blue and I have to mix some of that white paint in to lighten it up? To me, that's what we're doing here. We're just trying to find the shade of blue that we want to paint with. I like the shaker. That shaker I started with isn't the exact version that I want or that's gonna fit this particular mix. Another song, that might be perfect. This one, we can hear it didn't seem to fit. So dynamic shape, envelope, this is something we're gonna address all the time. It's not just since it's with your samples and drums as well. So I've been hinting at this next one a bunch and it's gonna be reverbs. The use of too many reverbs on your drums and specifically different reverbs. So in this case, I had my clap hitting this Valhalla room. Right, then the open hat is also hitting. All right, now my top loop here has another reverb on, completely different space. You can see the shaker has a reverb. The metallic perk has its own reverb. This is gonna create a lack of continuity when you have so many different reverbs with different decay times, different space settings. We're also just slapping them on as inserts and washing away some of the dry signal not the best approach. When we're trying to get continuity out of our drums, one of the benefits is sharing the same one or two spaces with our entire kit, which we're gonna see in the third example. And the other thing too is just like the length of the, uh, the decay is too long in so many cases. Like similar to what we were talking about with the samples being very long, a lot of time your ear is going to hear these reverb decays and be like, oh shit, this sounds nice, like, right? Like, but, we want this reverb to match what the track is giving us. So for example, once again, if I take this idea, don't be afraid to take this parameter and adjust it while you're listening. Like go too far, go too short, find the middle ground. Now we also saw before that this clap was too long in general. So let me shorten it again. And now let's add the tail back ourselves with the reverb. Something like that is appropriate. The reverb is not getting in the way of the other sounds, but it's still putting a nice little space uh, around the clap. It's filling space dynamically between all my other drum hits. This is more realistic. For the final thing we can improve on our level two drums, it's this over-reliance on the drum group solving your issues, like group processing solving your issues. In this instance, I'm doing a shit ton of compression. I'm doing a shit ton of EQ boosting and I'm like limiting the hell out of my drums to make them work, to make them sound how I want them to sound. The point of a drum group is to kind of control, shape, and balance them as a whole. But if you're not already at, or close, I should say, to the sound you want going into the drum group, you're fucked. Like, the, the, the magic is made on the individual level. If you can always fix something on an individual level, do so. And the reason is you're producing the song. This is not like you're a mix engineer and someone's handing you stems you have to work with and you can't sometimes go in and fix these things if it's in a full drum loop stem. Like, no, these instruments are right in front of us. I can go back and if I say, hey, you know, I need to boost the highs of my drum group. 
it sounds better when I boost those. Well, why don't I just go back to the individual channels and raise the volume of the sound that's sitting in that space? Or if I'm saying, hey, I need more low end here, why not raise the volume of the kick? Or, or it could be a bass issue, right? We're raising the volume of the bass. Don't forget too, like when you do group processing, you're affecting every sound. So although you wanted to boost the high end, you're technically boosting the high end of every element that is in that group. So basically that move is you saying, oh, I wanna boost the highs of my kick, my clap, my open hat, my top loop, my shaker, my perks, my fills. Is that really what your intention was? Cause that's technically what's happening. Everything in that group is being raised in volume on the highs. Instead, go back to the original and fix it. All right, we've made it to level three. Let me play you the loop. Let's check this out. Now this does sound significantly better than the previous two, but honestly, I think it's just a result of doing those things that we spoke about. Like those things that we could have improved in level one and level two are just being done here. It's the execution of those things. And that's what I wanna show you is once you see it put into practice, I really believe you could implement this today in your own drums and literally level up. So let's go through 10 of these uh, positives that we can kind of take a look at and see example by example. So for the first one, I wanna just talk about the length of this. This now is significantly longer than the previous other loops. This is a 16 bar uh, drum section. And if you notice, I have saved things for the second eight bars that the first eight bars didn't have. So if you think about it, it's like by saving these elements for the second half, the drums kind of take a step up. It feels like the track is progressing. The story is evolving. Some examples of this, you really see it come into play uh, with the ride symbol over here and a bunch of fills the first section doesn't have. So this kind of does its thing. All right, now you have an idea of what this drum kit is. It's like, all right, I get the idea. I get the vibe. And then second half, all of a sudden, Those weren't there the first time around it, and they're just kind of accenting the groove and rhythm that was already, uh, that already exists here. It's minor, but it's a step up. So longer loop, it keeps your attention longer. That's the first important part. Next, let's talk about variation. And I think if you haven't been doing this, this is gonna be extremely eye-opening. So I wanna show you the extent of variation that's going on here. Let's just start with the kick. So definitely some more little kick fills and hits. Now all this is, is the actual same kick. I just bump it up a couple half steps and it creates like a cool rhythmic variation by bumping it up too, there isn't as much low end anymore. All right, now let's also talk variation. First two bars are different than the next two bars. So even how I'm using it is switching up every two bars. Also kind of playing with uh, dropping out the kick for these last two beats and then reverse kick into the next eight bar section. So this is literally just the kick before reversed. Then next I wanna show you the claps. So how these are put together with variation. What you might've noticed is every other clap gets this one added over here. That only comes in on every other clap. So check this out, listen again. Without it, you kind of lose that pronunciation. So it's like kick, clap, kick, 
clap, kick, clap, kick, clap. It kind of gives you like that extra little pop. So the other thing I add are some reverse claps. And what you'll notice is it's every couple bars, it's reversing into the claps. And what you'll notice is it gives like a little precursor to the clap. So next we're gonna look at a real subtlety, um, but I love this. I remember the first time I saw this in a tutorial on YouTube when I learned this, I was like, holy shit, this is so cool. It just adds a bit of like humanization to the drum, some variation. I'm just using the built-in LFO uh, effect from Ableton and I can map this to any parameter. So basically what I've done is I've mapped it to the fade out. And what I'm telling it to do is with a random shape, it's going to just keep moving this parameter. And I could set the range of how far I want it to move, but notice what it's doing. It's randomly changing the length of my sample, essentially, right? It's fading it more or less. So each hit will never be the same. It's slightly different. Now, this isn't something that should be obvious because that might create too much of a dynamic change where it's gonna sound off, but these little subtleties make it so it's less robotic. The other one I'm doing with my shaker here, same concept, but I have it mapped to the attack. It's uh, creating variety between the hit of every single shaker. Some are a little more transient, some are a little more uh, smooth on, on the attack portion. But again, it's creating that cool variation. And then same with the MIDI notes inside. I'm doing it with velocity and timing. I've nudged them off the grid slightly. And I play with the different velocities here where I can make it louder, quieter, more pronounced, less pronounced. Think of this like the strike of the shaker, how hard it's, it's actually uh, shook. Or if it's a drum, how hard they hit the drum. That's what velocity can control. Versus if I take all these and just make them machine gun. Kind of cheesy, kind of fake. So let's move on to the third. I think you get the point with that. And we're going to go right back to the kick. Let's just talk about it's a better kick than the previous one. Uh, this kick is much, much stronger sounding. And if we quickly visualize this inside of span. Plenty of low end. This kick has a ton. When you have good kicks or you find good kicks, save them. Put them in a custom folder. You could always reuse them. That's what this was. Moving on to the fourth tip here I want to give you, and that is cleaning up some of these sounds with subtractive EQ and probably even more so surgically EQ. A lot of sounds in your drum kit are going to have resonance. And what that could be is those harsh, shrill, piercing frequencies when you listen to something and it kind of just sounds like shit or it hurts your ears. A lot of your tonal drum elements, um, distortion and overdrive can contribute to this. Your cymbals usually have some piercing frequencies. You want to clean this shit up. If we take the perk metallic layer in here, I have the headphones lit up, which is going to mean when I click this shape, we'll just hear the isolated frequency. Listen to this part of the sound. I don't want to lose that completely, but I also don't need that, you know, piercing shrill frequency to be the loudest part of this sound. That's not nice. It's not pleasant. Another example here would be um, the off hat. That's nasty like that. I don't I don't need the tonality from this hat. I want the sound of the hi hat. When I think of a hi hat, do I think of that tone? Of course not. Next, let's jump down to this ride symbol here and I'm just going to AB this EQ so you could hear the difference. One is pleasant, one's not. Still sounds like a ride after I've cleaned it up, but um leaving the frequencies that actually sound nice. This is just examples through this particular drum kit, but this is the same concept you'll take through your instruments throughout the whole mix. If there are parts of that signal that are harsh, you wanna get rid of them before you move forward to group processing and mastering. Now for five and six, we're gonna do two for one. We're gonna talk about layering 
and then we're going to couple that layering with stereo space and balance. I think they go hand in hand as you're layering. You should also be thinking about separating them in the stereo field. So I want to show you some cool ways I've approached that in here and things you could take into your own production. Let's start with the kick. This is a really small one, but I always like to try and layer my kick with something. I call it a kick exciter, uh, but basically I start with the kick. And this is just, if we take all this shit off, bring the volume up. It was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a hi-hat sample, but like a, a white noise hi-hat sample. All I'm doing then is adding a little bit of chorus. Then some reverb using uh, the black hole. Adds like a cool rhythmic, you know, value to this. Finally cleaning up with some coloring EQ and then just making it super quiet. So it's just a minor bit of excitement. All right, now let's move to the claps. And we kind of looked at these earlier, but let's specifically look at the layers and what the strategy was. We started with this first clap here. Basic central, you know, center focused kind of clap. The second one here. To me, two different things. First off, you notice it's wider. So I'm using a Haas effect right here to make it wider. And it also is a bit brighter in its sound. It sounds like brighter noise on top of the first one. So when we talk about layering, first up, they should be different. If it's the same sound, they're not gonna bring anything new to the table. Your ear is not gonna be able to separate the two. In this case, the first clap was dead center. This next one, I just spread wide as fuck to get them out of the way. Then we jump to layer three. So this is like a mouth kind of sample and very, very different than the first two. This one adds a bit more like crunch and, and, and transient to it, pitched low, but the sound is so different than the others. I thought this worked really, really well. And then we add that every other one that we talked about before. Then moving to the hats, same concept. I started with this one here. So hat one is like your classic kind of drum machine hi-hat sound. Off hat two, it's a little bit noisier, a little more chaotic kind of sounding, but they complement each other very well. Then the third one is a super wide shaker, once again, doing the Haas effect to get it out the way, but different sound now, shaker out wide. Now we're gonna stay here and we're gonna tackle seven and eight together. We're gonna go back to the sounds themselves and talk about their shape as well as their pitch to work together and tonally fit. So what you'll notice on the shaker is I have a gate and what this is doing is cleaning up all of this in between to make it tighter. So listen to what happens if I turn this off versus putting it back on. Also keep in mind as I compress later on in the group, as I compress my master, that shit, that quiet little bit that you might be like, ah, it's not that big of a deal, that gets brought out through compression. So you wanna make sure that's cleaned up well before. Next up is gonna be an example of pitching some of my drum layers to fit. This is only one semitone I'm pitching this hi-hat up. But this was the original sample. So let's listen in context. Now, you may sit there and be like, I like it better at zero. I liked plus one a little bit better because it got the hi-hats out of the way of that metallic perk layer. I wanted my hi-hats to be a bit higher and noisy for this. Also keep in mind, this is not a full song. I'm gonna probably have other shit going on in the mids. I didn't want my hi-hat to be too, too uh, low in terms of pitch, but you could do this by ear as it's playing.
But you see how some of them don't sound as good. I love doing this by ear. I never just take a sample and then just drop it and assume it's gonna fit. I always play with the pitch. The mouth clap. Again, you see it's pitched plus three. I'm not looking for the key of these. I'm literally just doing this by what sounds best with everything else going on. That was the original. You hear how like deep and dark that is? Now to look at some of the envelope and shape that we talked about before, we're looking at this clap and notice I've adjusted the starting point to begin with. So we're not using the full thing here. And we see a tail, but why is it not playing that tail? Well, that's going to be because I've shortened the MIDI note to an extremely short length and it's just full sustain and very little release. So that basically means while the MIDI note is triggered, it will play at full volume, but when the MIDI note stops, the sample will stop. If I were to lengthen the MIDI note, watch what happens. So once again, getting control of that shape, making it tight exactly how I want it to fit the dynamics of my track. So try and keep those things in mind, pitch and shape, tightening things that you can tighten. And we can always fill that space once we have it available, which leads us to the next tip. And that's back to reverb, but let's use it in a smarter way. So majority of the drum sounds that have reverb are being sent to this same return, which is a short plate. So you'll notice a lot of sounds are using the send and return amount, but by doing this on individual layers, some don't have reverb, some do. Some have more, some have less, but a lot of them are sharing the same space. There's a couple that might have a reverb on them, but it's, it's very few. Majority, if they're gonna have reverb, are, are benefiting from the same space here. And what I have first here is an EQ cleaning up some of the low end, but I'm using this, uh, EMT 250 emulation, it's the ERS 250, but it sounds like this, the reverb. Notice how subtle it is, but it's space filler. Like I'm not letting the reverb destroy this mix. It's subtly filling the space. You definitely notice the difference though. Kind of adds that subtle energy behind everything. Now, if I had this decay time set way longer, things can get problematic. Now back to our original settings, much shorter, it's more appropriate, it fits. And I do this the same way we did it before. Like I'll listen in context, make the reverb too long by bringing it up, wash things out, make it too short so it's too tight, too abrupt, and then find the in-between that sounds best. In this case, I landed on 0.8, purely random. Every track will be different. Sometimes I'll play with some pre-delay, sometimes I won't really depends, um, as well as the reverb itself can be different in every track. Next, I'm doing some surgical EQ, which is really just cleaning up the reverb itself. Finally, because it's here, I feel like I might as well show you, I do have a compressor, compressing the reverb, make it more consistent, and de the harsh frequencies. But the key takeaway, a lot of my reverbs here, if we open these up, you can see a lot of them are being sent by different amounts. Some more, some less, but they share the same space that creates continuity. I've pulled these samples from a lot of different packs. Now it kind of sounds like they're all part of the same kit. All right, we've done it. We've made it to the 10th and final tip in the level three drums. And it's me saying thank you for sticking around. I appreciate you watching this video. 
If you did find this valuable, please let me know in the comments. If you have questions, let me know in the comments. I'm here to help all of you. I want to see you succeed. I want to see you be able to take your drum game to the next level. And if you haven't already, please hit that thumbs up on this video. Give it a like, subscribe. We put out videos every single week. And until the next one, I wish you well. I'll see you.